In Franz Kafka's novel, The Trial, the protagonist, Joseph K., embarks on a journey against an inscrutable legal system that accepts no authority but its own and has no apparent regard for reason or justice. K. is arrogant, ambitious, and impatient, but has not committed any crime. The court and its officials are repugnant, suggesting internal and external corruption. The initial inquiry is held at a rundown unit of an apartment building, while the court offices are in the even more rundown attic of an apartment building. Kay's case highlights the relationship between law and guilt. The warders who arrest Kay inform him that they cannot tell him the charges that have been brought against him, only that proceedings are underway and you'll learn everything in due course. None of the court officials, including the examining magistrate, are any more informative, and the charges against Kay are never revealed. The implication of this statement is that actual guilt or innocence has no relationship to the court's eventual verdict, as both the charges and evidence are inaccessible to the accused. The court assumes that nobody is ever entirely guiltless, and from the beginning of the novel, various court officials repeatedly remind Kay that the fact that he is ignorant of his crime does not mean that his crime is not serious. Guilt arises not from one's actions, but from the court's judgment, and once assigned, it cannot be expunged. Kay's situation becomes increasingly surreal and ambiguous, as does Kay's response to it. The absurdity of bureaucracy is apparent from the beginning, as explains the nonsensical conditions of Kay's arrest. You're under arrest, certainly, but that's not meant to keep you from carrying on your profession, nor are you to be hindered in the course of your ordinary life. Kay's actions suggest that these words are mere posturing. He comes to the court in Chapter 4, even though he has not been summoned, and later is on the verge of entering into a physical altercation with the law student. Following his confrontation with the law student, Kay reflects that this defeat could have been avoided had he ignored his case and stayed home and led his normal life. Yet Kay accepts the usher's invitation to follow him to the court offices in the attic, giving the impression that Kay cannot help but take his case seriously. The sense of surrealism or unreality becomes stronger over the course of the novel. During the story, Kay becomes increasingly preoccupied with his case, unable to feign indifference towards his trial and its outcome. He learns more about the court from lawyer Hold and painter Titarelli which seems almost allegorical. The court is completely arbitrary and corrupt, with many trials like Kay's influenced not by evidence, but by one's relationships with officials of the lower court. Kafka's court has nameless characters like the flogger, representing its punitive aspect and virtual omnipresence. The court chooses to conduct its business in dark, hidden, and airless places, such as attics or the junk room of Kay's bank. It revels in contradictory symbols, such as the combination of justice and victory K, spots on one of Titarelli's portraits. The possible outcomes of the trial highlight its absurdity as it works actively to thwart interpretation. The court of Kafka's novel can be seen as a critique of the extensive bureaucracies of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which Kafka, as an insurance agent, knew intimately. Some critics see the court as a critique of the extensive bureaucracies of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, while others view it as a critique of the hierarchical and corrupt religious institutions of the early modern period. The role of women in the novel is also noteworthy. In early 20th century Prague, women of the working class often served as the mistresses of men in the professional class, such as the banker K, or even Kafka himself. This practice, a product of the relative powerlessness of lower-class women during the period, is recreated in the novel. By Chapter 6, three women have shown some sort of sexual interest in K, namely Fräulein Burstner, the usher's wife, and Lenny. However, K is ultimately too conceited to interrogate the matter more deeply, and his reliance on these women actually harms him over the course of the novel.
On multiple occasions, Kay compromises his case for women, such as in his confrontation with the law student in Chapter 4, and later by ignoring the chief clerk to spend time with Lenny in Chapter 7. Chapters 8 to 10 of the novel revolve around Kay's trial, where Kay dismisses his lawyer due to growing frustration with his case. He encounters Rudy Block, another defendant who serves as a source of information on the workings of the court. Block's case is five years old, and he is in a much more advanced state of psychological subjugation than Kay. However, he is not entirely without dignity, and his encounter with Block cements Kay's resolve to dismiss his lawyer. Kay's obsession with his case feeds a persecution mania that extends beyond the trial, leading to worries about his job at the bank and fears that his rival, the vice president, is sabotaging him. Kay increasingly views the court as hostile and corrupt, though the priest cautions him against this view. The priest's parable or allegory of the doorkeeper provides an elusive reflection on Kay's experience with the court. Several different interpretations of the parable are furnished by the priest and disputed by Kay, most of which hinging on the question of who is the deceiver and who is the deceived. In the end, Kay concludes that both the doorkeeper and the man are deceived. However, he recoils from the priest's final suggestion that the court's actions need not be rooted in truth so long as they are necessary. The priest's justification powerfully illustrates the relationship between law and guilt, suggesting that if everyone is always already guilty, the court arises out of necessity to address that guilt. The end of the novel leaves many questions unanswered, with a great gap between the end and the previous chapter leaving the reader to wonder what actions Kay has taken since his conversation with the priest. The sense of incompleteness is partly due to the novel's unfinished state, but Kafka seems to have made the end deliberately abrupt. The novel ends exactly where it began, in Kay's room, exactly a year later, creating a kind of ring structure. This ring structure highlights how much Kay has changed with all resistance gone and he willingly goes to his death. If you have any suggestion of which book I should summarize, please let me know in the comments, and if you enjoyed this, please like and subscribe.